In this edition of The Written Word, we explore inner guru with life coach and author Charles D'Angelo. We also speak with activist author George Lakey about his new book, Viking Economics. But first, Charles D'Angelo. Inner guru, uh, the guide to mastering your health, wealth, and relationships from the inside out. Yes. How did you decide to write this book? You'd already written Think and Grow Thin, best-selling book. Why this one? Well, I found in almost 15 years of weight loss coaching, the very disciplines that I helped to transform other people's lives, losing 150, 200, 300 pounds sometimes, the, the disciplines that I used myself to lose 160 pounds as a teenager had direct applicability to mastering other issues, whether it be really creating or reigniting relationship, uh, passion and juice and love, if it was creating a better financial picture for yourself, or if it was really getting deeper into reclaiming your health from your habits. So the disciplines that you can use in weight loss have such application in all these other areas. And I found when people were coming to my office, very rarely was the problem the food. People were using food to deal with emotional issues. And once we got the weight out of the way, it allowed for us to really work with what was the story, what was the narrative, what was the script that was keeping people stuck in a place they really didn't want to be in. And, and you talk so much about the reframing your life, creating a new story. Yes. Uh, and, and, and it's such a powerful message that you said that losing weight, it masks other issues you're trying to fill a void perhaps with exactly. that other addiction so many people when they get a sense of some emptiness within themselves they rush to fill it and that void is important because that void tells you you have room to grow but a lot of people misinterpret that void as there's something missing in my life i'm not good enough people don't like me and they rush to do something to distract themselves from really growing into that space they fill it with something that doesn't last very long. For me, as a teenager, when I weighed 360 pounds, it was food. For some people, it's harder drugs. It's heroin, it's fentanyl, it's, it's alcohol. Or for others, it's going from one relationship to the next, to the next, to the next, trying to get their needs met from things that can't meet those needs in any real sustainable, lasting way. So in Inner Guru, I walk people through not only how to lose 100, 150, 200 pounds, how to improve their financial health, how to sustain or create a relationship, but really, how do you take control of your own psychology so that you can begin to become the director of your life and not allow your past to do that? And so how do you do that? I don't necessarily need to give away the whole shot, but how do you get started? The first thing you have to ask yourself is, what do I really believe? You gotta examine your belief system. For a lot of us, Let's take it in the weight dimension because right now there's almost 70% of the U.S. population who's overweight. A lot of people look at their weight, let's say they have 50, 80, 100 pounds to lose. Maybe in the past they've told themselves, I've tried, but they fall back in their old patterns and they find they regain the weight or even more. So they feel very disempowered. So they come up with this, this excuse or the story, well, I must have something wrong with me or because my family's all overweight. They have this whole list of blame uh, reasons of why they are the way they are. So you've got to exchange that list of why I am the way I am for what I'm going to do to get to where I must be. So you have to ask yourself, do you think it's possible for you? And of course it's possible. You can find people who have lost 100, 150 pounds. You can look at my website, charlesdangelo.com, and you'll see people about over 400 videos of there on there of people who I've helped personally to coach their goals. So we know it's possible. The second thing you have to ask yourself is, am I really at the place in my life where I want it? A lot of people tell themselves they want it, but when it comes down to actually following through on the daily disciplines, they find they want the product without the process. We're in a, a kind of a microwave society where we want what we want, when we want it, as quickly as possible. And the reality is everything has a gestation period. A lot of people label themselves as failures, not because they were incapable of reaching their goals, but because they gave up too soon. They were right on the threshold of making a breakthrough, and usually right when you're about to break through is when the biggest obstacles come your way. So if you're sitting at home and you're listening to this or you're watching this, and you feel like I've tried everything, and every time I get close, I, I step back, you've gotta ask yourself, do I really think that, I, that it's possible for me? 
Do I really want it? At the superficial level, of course you say you want it. But when you think about what it's going to take to get there, sometimes you have some work to do at looking at that. Number three, well, and, you, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, you mentioned the biggest obstacles and people getting up too soon. Yes. What are those obstacles, those roadblocks, those bit blips? What do they look like? What it's form do they come in? Emotional discomfort. So anything that stresses us, a lot of people tell themselves they're emotional eaters. And this is what ties into this, this third piece of belief system. We have, do I think it's possible? Secondly, do I really want it? But thirdly, do I really feel that I deserve this? A lot of people have this limiting belief that because of where they came from, who they spend time with, that they don't deserve all they really want. And it seems pretty psychoanalytical, right, to say that, but when you stop and think about it, a lot of people, when they start to make changes, they find even their peer group changes. And that scares a lot of people. When all of a sudden you start to change, other people start to become a little alarmed. Even if you're not being successful, just the idea that you're working to change yourself, it really, for other people that know they probably should be doing the same thing, it can really unsettle them. So we'll, we'll be met with emotional discomfort. Maybe the people we used to spend time with don't want to spend time with us anymore. And so many people will put misery in the seat that loneliness should sit in. They don't like being with themselves. They don't like feeling emotions. And what they tend to do is distract themselves. It's what I used to do. When I was in a place where I felt everything was out of control, I wanted to change how I felt in the moment. And the way that I did that was using food. What are you using to change how you feel right now? What are you using to keep yourself from dealing with the real issues? And once you start to look at what the real issue is, you mentioned earlier this void. Once you start to look at what am I really feeling called to do? When you stop letting your history define your present moment experience, you start thinking more about your future and you actually start to design your future, you don't have so much anxiety about it. So many people have so much apprehension, so much worry, so much fear because they haven't given much consideration to where they're headed. They haven't really thought about the direction they're moving. And when you stop and you pause, and you ask yourself, by doing what I'm thinking of doing, eating that piece of cake, uh, taking that drug, uh, going from this relationship to another, am I just going to have to go through the same thing over and over and over again? Look at relationships. How many people we know have went through four, five, six different marriages, and they've married people with different names but the same issue? You've got to look at the only way that change happens, and it's by changing yourself. And lastly, does it fit my life? When you want to become fit and healthy, as I said, there's going to be a lot of change. You're, you're going to have to recognize the standards that you have for yourself are going to really impact everything else. When you're more disciplined, you're going to find you're more disciplined in other areas. And there's a positive to that, but there's also what many might think of as a negative. Again, you're going to have to put yourself in a position of taking care of you first. Many people think, especially moms, think that that's selfish. You know, how should, why should I put myself first? I mean, I've got to take care of my kids. But I always use the, the old metaphor, the old example of if an airplane's going down and the oxygen mask drop. They don't tell you if that happens to put the oxygen on your kid first, do they? They say put it on yourself first. So you've got to take care of yourself if you want to be able to serve, if you want to be able to be the best parent, if you want to be able to be the best spouse, if you want to be the best career professional, whatever it is that you want to really master, you've got to make the investments in yourself so you have more to bring to everything that you're spending your time doing. So what's fascinating is that transformation and change, There's um, the word loss comes up but for or uh, perhaps there's a way to reframe that is what you're suggesting. That makes if you room get your, for if you get, Yes, if you get your ego out of the way, because our ego thinks of everything as in terms of physical presence, there isn't any loss. You are still the same you, even though if we took a picture of you, Audrey, from 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you don't look the same, but you're still you. So there, there's an essence to everything. What you really want to ask yourself isn't how is change going to come about, it's do I want to really direct it? Because that's what your opportunity is through my book, Inner Guru, is taking charge 
of the inevitabilities of life. There's going to be all sorts of adversity. Just because you're going to have more opportunities doesn't mean you're not going to have more challenges or more difficulties. That's the nature of life. So I always tell people, understand, become a, a, a hungry learner. W try to get around people that have really mastered the areas of life that you want to take charge of. If you'll put yourself just in proximity to them, if you'll get around the people that have great marriages, great relationships, that have great health, that are wealthy in every sense of the word, by osmosis, just by being around them, you'll start to mirror, to model those same behaviors. Who you spend time with has a tremendous impact on who you become. And the way you talk to yourself is often learned by those you spend time with. So if you think in a very limited way, you've got to ask yourself, well, I certainly wasn't born with this vocabulary, so where did I learn it? I don't think there's so many losses. I think that if you recognize that everything presents a certain opportunity, for every door that closes, there's a door that opens. But most of us, when a door closes, we sp spend so much time looking at the door that closed, we miss the one that God just opened. So you've got to bring faith into this. And I'm not here to proselytize or preach. I tell people that I don't think you can reach success by faith alone. But I don't think you can reach success without it. So it's really important that you integrate all these different things into a system that works for you, that keeps you motivated, that keeps you going, so that not only do you free yourself of the weight if that's the challenge you're dealing with, but you also begin to get down to the real core issues of feeling that you do deserve the life that you want to construct for yourself and really getting excited about doing just that. Charles, before we wrap up, and I am mindful of our time together, it is a little limited, I'm curious about your creative process. Sure. Uh, when do you write? What inspires you? Who inspires you? What is your uh, recommendation for people, maybe even who just want to sit down and, and not necessarily sit down, but write a book as well, like you did? I am a voracious learner. Any free time I have, and when I say free time, I mean the time I don't spend with my weight loss coaching clients or my life coaching clients, I am learning. And I learn from anything. I learn from this conversation. Just talking to you, I'm picking things up. I don't think that we have to spend as much time consciously uh, working on how we're, we're going to become successful if we'll find learning to be enjoyable. Learning, I think, is really the key to any lasting success. Achievers, leaders are readers. They're people that constantly are taking in information. Now, you've got to ultimately come to your own conclusions after you read what you're going to read and listen to what you're going to listen to and watch what you're going to watch. But I would become mindful <clears throat> of what you're allowing to influence you. My creative process is making sure I'm staying in alignment with those things and, and those sources of wisdom, of information that are all about opportunity. They're not about fear. And so it's very important that you become focused on putting yourself in alignment with those things that are congruent with the vision you have for yourself in your life. When I wrote Inner Guru, I see myself as a conduit, as uh, something by which a greater force than me comes through me. I, I read those books that I've written and I sometimes wonder where'd that all come from. So if you'll just make it the habit of dedicating and feeding your mind as often as you feed your body, and mind you, you should be feeding your body about every three hours, you'll find that inevitably you'll be learning, you'll be growing, you'll be improving. But don't rush the process. Again, so many people, you know, they're, they're wanting to, in, in the vernacular of today, to become hustlers and all this stuff. And they're doing it at the expense of, of meaningful relationships. You go to restaurants and you see people that are sitting across from each other on their phone. Connection is a key to real, lasting love, growth, contribution. And in order to have that connection, you've got to know yourself. And you've got to get your ego out of the way. So I would put less focus in the creative process on the outcome and more on the purpose. Wanting to contribute, wanting to bring something to the world or bring something through you into the world. I think if that becomes your focus in your creative process, you won't have to worry about it reaching a lot of people, touching a lot of people, and making a huge difference. That's always been my experience. I, I would put less focus on profit and a lot of focus on purpose. And with that recipe, I'm certain that you'll succeed. We've been speaking with wellness expert Charles D'Angelo, author of Inner Guru, the guide to mastering your health, wealth, and relationships from the inside out. Coming up, activist George Lakey, author of Viking Economics. 
Welcome back to The Written Word. In this segment, we hear from activist author George Lakey. We spoke with Lakey at Acapella Books in Atlanta about his latest book, Viking Economics, how the Scandinavians got it right and how we can too. Well, I'm very interested in the four countries that had Vikings as their ancestors, and I'm interested in what they have done with the 20th century in order to move them into the top ranks of accomplishment in terms of equality, in terms of individual freedom, in terms of shared prosperity. And because they've done so well with their economies, I thought, well, it might be a cute title to call them, you know, the Viking uh, economic model. But actually, economists call them the Nordic economic model. Yeah. And uh, shared, you use the word shared, what, what a concept mm. that perhaps we don't even have. Yeah, shared in. prosperity. That's, That's the only kind they want. One of the earliest things they did after they were able to make their changeover was to uh, roll up their sleeves to abolish poverty because they thought poverty is not a good idea. In fact, they thought poverty was so 19th century. Why would anybody bother in an advanced economy to have poverty. And so uh, one of the chapters in my book it tells exactly how they went about getting rid of poverty in those countries. So the, I'm looking here at the, at yeah. the tagline there, how, yeah. how they've got it right and mm -hmm. we can too. That's right. How do we go from where we're at, where certainly poverty is you know, part of the culture almost, right. for a variety of reasons. Well, I was very interested in that because uh, it's it, mostly when we hear about the Scandinavians, when we hear about Norwegians and Swedes and Danes, we mostly hear about uh, it's basically a photo of what they have today. And that's very impressive, right? Like free higher education, excellent health care available to all, affordable child care for all, universal pensions, nobody's poor when they're old, that kind of thing. So that's very impressive. But I was curious about how did they get there? Because we're very far from there. But what if we chose to adopt that model? Then we'd have a whole struggle about getting there. So I wanted to know what their struggle was. And let me tell you, oh, it was a real struggle. Nobody had handed that to them. In fact, a century ago, they were in such bad shape that they were migrating like crazy. Tons of Norwegians came here, right? Came to the US uh, and to Canada. And Swedes did the same. Sweden was hemorrhaging its people because of lack of opportunity, endemic poverty, that kind of thing. And so what a century ago they had was, uh, was so miserable. And then turning themselves around to be at the top of the international charts today, I thought, we need to find out about that transition. Because if you could turn yourself around as a society, that gives hope to any other society where people might like to turn their situation around rather than just resign themselves to whatever it is they've got. So did it take public-private partnerships? Did what, it what took mainly pressure from the grassroots. The grassroots people organized for one thing, co-ops economic co-ops of various kinds, like consumer co-ops, producer co-ops, in order to teach themselves the skills of cooperation and of working together for the common good. So they did a lot of that in the, t in the teens of the 1900s and the 20s and the 30s. But another big thing they did was to form movements that developed so much power that they were able to throw the economic elite out of its dominance. Because those countries a century ago were all being run by their economic elites. They're, you know, what these days we call the 1%, right? But that's what people were, were used to, had been for centuries. And the thing was that they knew that the economic elite did not have the interests of the whole society at heart. And so even though they had parliaments, true, and they did have free elections, yes, that's true, but nevertheless, it was, no matter what the majority wanted, it was somehow the economic elite that got its way, which I believe is what's happening in the United States today. So I thought, well, that's interesting, that they were able to organize themselves on a grassroots level into such powerful combinations that they were able to do basically what Dr. King was doing and so many wonderful people in the South were doing, which was nonviolent, civil disobedience campaigns, strikes, boycotts, demonstrations that amassed so much power, the economic elite was just pushed out of the way. They were not rubbed out. It wasn't like next door Russia, you know, where it was a rub out the elite. No, no, no. They didn't want to do that. They were advised to do that by some of the Russian communist revolutionaries. They said, no, 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 that's not our way. Our way is to be nonviolent, but we believe we can have a revolution through nonviolent struggle, which is what Dr. King came to the view of toward the end of his life. And so that's when they pulled off. 
Are there examples of some of those elites then, I don't know if you say, you know, seeing the light and joining in this um, shift? In I'm, I've looked and looked and I haven't found any of the adult elite uh, people who made that uh, alliance, but their children, something else again, right? So that's the thing, send your children to university, next thing you know, those students, they'll be looking around, and a bunch of students of the elite, and of course middle class students especially, were fascinated with what the workers were doing, what the farmers were doing, what poor people were doing, and they joined in solidarity. And then they brought a lot of skills, of course, that they, you know, they, they, uh, they brought a lot of educational skills. So then when the transition would happen, the, econo the, the party that represented the conservatives were out, the, the economic elite, and then the majority could take over, then those students became the new civil servants, you know, because they had the technical expertise and, and they were on the side of the majority. So was there, for lack of a better word, a straw that broke the camel's back or like- There was, that, there you know, was. There had been, you know, the co-ops, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. And that was like, we have our, we have someone who does not represent the best interests. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, like a powder keg. There was. There was a powder keg. It, it happened in different countries at different times because each of these four countries I studied has its own, you know, uniqueness. Um, on the other hand, uh, they shared what they resulted in, which was the economic model. Uh, the Swedes were the first to make a big breakthrough and that was in 1931 when there was a, an important strike in a mill town and the uh, strikers were you know uh, doing nonviolent demonstrations and marches that kind of thing what you'd expect uh, the troops were called out troops were often called out by the economic elite to defend their privilege and so the troops came out they did a massacre killed unarmed people in the streets so the response in Sweden was to call a general strike nationwide not just that locality nationwide and so many Swedes responded and went on strike that it became a power vacuum the economic elite realized oh my gosh these people won't be governed by us anymore we're done and that pushed them out of out of the position that didn't happen in Norway until five years later 1936 by then the Norwegians had made their country ungovernable by the economic elite, throw much no saying, you know, so no, we're not gonna follow the rules, we're not gonna do what you tell us. Disruption, disruption, disruption. And then in 1936, the elite said, okay, we're ready to bargain. And they sat down with the people's movements and worked out a compromise that that said, okay, so you can still run your shipbuilding firm, you know, you can still run your bank, however, we're going to put lots of rules on you. We're going to tax you like crazy because our, uh, the economic model that we prefer is one that r distributes the wealth instead of having the wealth hoarded by the 1% and let the rest of us be poor. Did some of those uh, entrepreneurs, industrialists leave? Mm -hmm. Oh well. yes, oh yes, some did leave. Not many, because one of the rules, since the, the, uh, the majority of people really took over the government, then they could create laws. And one of the laws was, uh, you can't take your capital out of the country. And so that was a hard choice then for you know, a millionaire of that day. Do, uh, do I leave, but I, most of my you know, property is, have, has to be left in the country. But some did that because they just were so furious that uh, of these upstart Democrats who believed you know, democracy is more important. <laughs> but, uh, but most people stayed partly because their children, a lot of their children were saying, you know, look dad, look mom, these, uh, democracy is actually a good thing and we will benefit in the long run, which has certainly turned out to be true. I have a whole chapter on uh, the response of today's economic elite to very high taxes, like 50% income taxes. In Norway, there's a wealth tax on top of that. So that almost 1% of each uh, of the wealth of each wealthy person is taxed each year each year, each year, each year, and very high inheritance taxes. And so uh, the interviews with those entrepreneurs and CEOs and so on are very revealing in which these people say, yeah, I, I know I could leave, but this is a, actually a great deal because you get so much for what you pay. I pay very high taxes, but I get so much in return. I don't have to worry about financing my kids' higher education. 
Hey, it's taken care of. I don't have to worry about catastrophic illness. Hey, it's taken care of. I don't have to worry about anything. So it's a, a low stress environment. And one result then is that there are more startups in Norway per capita than there are in the United States. So actually they support their entrepreneurs with this more egalitarian model. And it really contradicts a lot of the assumptions that Americans make about the economy. One of the, I guess, easy criticisms, if you will, or when I've mentioned uh, the title of this book mm -hmm. to um, others, you, know, you hear, and this is nothing new, well, you know, that's a homogeneous, mm -hmm. you know, racially, mm -hmm. ethnically mm -hmm. homogeneous, uh, mm -hmm. you know, culture in these countries. Yeah. To what yeah. extent is that uh, either, and what would be the word, an irrelevant hmm. concept? Hmm. Hmm. Is it a false? No, I think I think it's both uh, irrelevant and relevant. The way it is relevant is that it's easier to develop unity among people in pushing for change, if you know if if you have an easy talking ground. You know, it's just easier to communicate, right? So that was an advantage for them. That worked for them. This was the twenties, the thirties, when they were very homogeneous cultures. Um, on the other hand, uh, the way it's not true is that this very same model that they created is now supporting populations that are highly diverse. One in five Norwegians is far foreign born. Swedes took in more immigrants than any European country per capita. So uh, they, they've got way, way, way more diversity now and the economic model works great. They're at the top of the line. So in that way, we can have a very diverse society, which our country is, and also have it, the, that economic model work really well for us. The question for us, of course, is how do we get enough unity to push the economic elite out of the way so that we can have what we want? But the polls say we want this kind of thing. And uh, that is harder, obviously, to build the unity across racial lines, to build the unity across religious lines, and so on. On the other hand, let's face it, they, they pulled it off in the 20s and 30s, the 1920s and 30s. Now how about, why don't we pull it off in the 2020s and 30s? Uh, because we've learned something about race relations in the meantime, right? We have not been impervious to the lessons learned uh, and how, how negative bigotry is. So let's learn those lessons, let's form the unities that we need and go ahead and do what needs to be done.